All right, let's talk about harmonic oscillators. So one common application of second order equations, differential equations to be specific, involves an object vibrating on a spring subject to dampening as illustrated below. So you have some mass object, K being our proportionality constant. There's some motion equation, equation of motion, an external force sometimes, that's not always gonna be the case, but in some cases we'll have an external force. And there is an equilibrium position. So clarifications, the object starts at rest position, that equilibrium position, meaning there's no stretch or um, compression on the spring. The spring is compressed or stretched, the spring is then released, and the object vibrates back and forth. The damper, also called a dash pot, resists the motion of the object. An external force may be applied to the object, further affecting the motion. Three forces acting on the object. Force from the spring. So Hooke's law for a spring states that the force of the spring is proportional to and in the opposite direction of the displacement from rest position as long as the displacement is relatively small. So we're talking about relatively small springs and most springs are, in most applications are not necessarily very lengthy because if you think about it, springs that have a long, uh, that are very long are going to, well, I guess that depends on how they're made. Um, but we're talking about relatively shorter springs um, in your shocks of your car, um in trampolines and um those bouncy things that used to bounce on as kids i can't even think like a pogo stick oh my gosh i probably just dated myself <laughs> okay so we're talking about smaller springs that we would use in everyday use i'm sure there's much larger springs that are used for much more massive projects and that is not what we're covering here so in terms of x this law says that the force from the spring can be calculated by the pro negative proportionality constant times x. For some constant that is positive, called the spring constant. The spring constant measures the stiffness of the spring, and the larger that k is, the stiffer the spring is. The second force is from the damper. So the damping force acts only when the mass is in motion. So when the mass is at equilibrium, uh, the damping force has no effect and is assumed to be proportional to and also an opposite direction of the velocity. So the velocity is described by x prime. As we know, the first derivative is our velocity. This means that the force of the damper can be equal to negative c, which is some constant, uh, times x prime. And this constant is also positive. The bigger that the constant c is, the stronger the dampening force. Make a note that this model is not the only possible way to describe the damping force, but it is definitely the simplest. Also, it tends to be very, act, uh, very accurate for slow moving objects. Our third force is the external one, which is not always uh, present in every problem. But if we do have an external force, it's possible it might be constant or it might be changing over time. It really depends on what the force is. So we describe this force as a function of time. So the force of the external is going to be described as some function in terms of t, where t represents time. And very often this force is zero. Newton's second law states that if we let m denote the mass of the object, which is fairly common, the acceleration of the object is described by the second derivative. As we already learned in calculus, the second derivative is acceleration. So putting those all together, the force of the spring plus the force of the damper plus the force of an external is equal to the mass times acceleration. So if we substitute in the, the, previous, uh, the previous 
uh, equivalent expression, sorry. Uh, we have the force of the spring is a negative k times x. The damper, negative c times the first derivative, velocity, plus a function in terms of time for any external force that might be applied on the spring, is equal to the mass times the second derivative, acceleration. After rearranging, we have the mass spring damper equation, m second times x double prime plus c x prime plus kx equals f of t. If the external force, meaning f of t, is not equal to zero, then we say that the system is driven. If there is no external force, f of t is equal to zero, then the model simplifies to the following, okay, where we are literally looking at an autonomous differential equation. So a differential equation of free undamped motion is when c is equal to zero, Okay, so that means that this velocity is going to not be present because you'll have c as the coefficient, which means we're only looking at the acceleration term and the spring force term, and also no external force. The equation of motion, so x of t is equal to, and the equation of motion being the solution to the differential equation, uh, C1 times cosine of beta t plus C2 times sine of beta t. Now the period of motion is 2 pi over beta, and this represents the time in seconds it takes the mass to, ex to execute one cycle of motion. The frequency of motion is beta over 2 pi, the reciprocal of period, and describes the number of cycles in one unit of time. The number beta is equal to the square root of the proportionality constant k divided by the mass m, and it's measured in radians per second. This is called the circular frequency of the system. Let's take a look at this first example. So we have a mass that is weighing two pounds, and it stretches a spring six inches. At time equals zero, so at the initial point, the mass is released from a point eight inches below equilibrium position with an upward velocity of four thirds feet per second. Let's determine the equation of motion. We have a little hint here that mass is equal to weight divided by g, where g is acceleration due to gravity. You've most likely seen this one is the most common, 9.8 meters per second squared, talking about how fast an object would pick up speed when dropped from a building, let's say. We work with this a lot in physics and calculus um, and engineering courses. So most of the time you would see it written in meters per second squared because those are the units we typically would um, default to. But Many times we have English units mixed in there, like feet or, um, well, centimeters isn't um, English units, but when we're talking about springs, sometimes meters is a little bit too big and we're talking about centimeters. So I wanted to give you all the conversions that you might possibly need. Okay, I'm going to move over to the whiteboard now. So you may want to keep this problem in front of you as I reference some of these pieces to the problem. To do that, you either have the PowerPoint in front of you or you can screenshot this, pause the video screenshot so that you can have the picture up in front of you while I walk you through the solution. Let's do that. Moving to the whiteboard. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do, and this you should be um, familiar with, is that whenever we're working inside of a problem, we need to make sure that our units match. And in this problem, I have pounds, I have inches, and I have feet per second. A whole lot of mixture there. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to do some conversions. And the first conversion I'm gonna do is change my inches into feet so that I can make sure everything is in feet since my velocity is in feet per second. It is much easier for me to change a flat inches into feet than it is for me to change a velocity unit. 
So I'm going to take that six inches that we were talking about the spring being stretched. And I want to translate six inches into feet. Now, many of you are probably sitting there like, I know that six inches is half a foot, but just in case we ever have to work with a much harder problem, let's remind ourselves about dimensional analysis for converting um, different units. So we first start by writing our six inches over one just to create the fraction. And next we wanna put in the conversion unit. So the conversion unit is the relationship between inches and feet. Now we know that one foot is equivalent to 12 inches. Now we need to know which way to put this conversion unit. Do we put 12 inches over one foot or one foot over 12 inches? And that will be decided by what we want our final answer to be. So we're looking to translate inches into feet, which means that feet needs to be at the top and the inches need to be on the bottom of the conversion unit so that it will cancel with the first fraction's inches in the numerator. So notice that diagonally inches crosses off with inches leaving us with six over 12 feet or a half a foot. Okay, that conversion is complete. The next one that I see in the problem is where this spring or where the mass begins, which is eight inches below equilibrium. So again, eight inches also needs to be translated into feet. So for the same reasons as before, I am going to put feet on top, cross off the inches, and this gives us eight over 12 feet, which reduces to two thirds feet. Okay, so now my inches have been converted into feet. The next conversion that I want to do is on those pounds. Now, technically I don't have to convert the pounds into a mass, uh, but for the purposes of understanding the unit that would happen when we do that, I want to make sure I bring our attention to that. So I'm going to do the conversion. So mass is equal to the weight of an object divided by the acceleration due to gravity. So we have two pounds, which is the weight of the mass, divided by 32 feet per second squared. And again, we're using the 32 feet per second squared because we know that our velocity is in feet per second. So this gives us one over 16 and we are gonna label this a slug. Now a slug is what I wanted to bring to your attention because that is probably a new unit for most of you. A slug is a unit of mass that accelerates by one foot per second squared when a force of one pound force is exerted on it. So because we are working with feet and not meters is why we are labeling our mass in slug unit. Okay, the condition of equilibrium. Condition of equilibrium. This condition is known by mass times acceleration due to gravity is equal to proportionality constant times S, where S is the stretch of the spring. So be careful, in a lot of problems, they give you the length of the spring, or they'll tell you that the string was stretched to a total of 12 inches, but the original size of the spring was six inches. So you need to make sure that you subtract, if you have a total stretch, you always subtract what the original length of the spring is to get just the stretch length, which would have been six inches in this case, oh, in my made up case. Okay, back to this problem. So let's take a note that when we are below equilibrium, it is positive displacement and above equilibrium is negative displacement. So that's something that we need to know. So let's write that down. So if we were taking a look at a string, let's say here's the mass. If a string, and this is equilibrium, 
if a string is stretched above, then we are going to have negative displacement. If the spring is stretched below, then we have positive displacement. OK, so now taking this equation of equilibrium, we want to find that portion that proportionality constant. Now, the reason why I said we didn't technically need to find the mass calculation is because weight is equal to mass times gravity due to acceleration. So I could have just said that the weight is equal to K times S, which is also true. So I didn't necessarily need to translate into the slug unit. But for the purposes of making sure we know about the slug unit, I wanted to cover it. OK, so let's use the mass times acceleration due to gravity is equal to K times S for this one. We have 1 16th slug times 32 feet per second squared is equal to that proportionality that we want to solve for. And now the stretch. Well, the stretch, if we go back to the problem, it says it stretched for six inches. So that's not a total length. That's actually the length of the stretch itself, which we've already converted into feet, one half feet. So we get 32 divided by 16 gives us two, two pounds. See, it would have been exactly the same even if we didn't convert it. To get rid of a fraction on this side, we multiply by the reciprocal and do the same to the other side, giving us a proportionality constant of two, uh, sorry, not two, of four, two times two is definitely four, pounds per foot. Okay, now that we have this constant, Let's talk about the initial displacement and the initial velocity. So our initial displacement is going to be talking about the spring and placement, remember, is x. So we have x at time 0. Because we are stretching this thing, or because it starts eight inches below equilibrium, remember that that is positive, and we've already translated eight inches into feet, which was two thirds. So that's our initial displacement point. Now our initial velocity, remember that velocity is the first derivative, so it would be x prime at zero. And we know that this thing is, uh, let's look back in the problem. So it's an upward velocity of 4 thirds feet per second. Now, because when you're going upwards, um, above equilibrium is a negative displacement, here with springs, moving upwards is a negative velocity. And I know that seems strange because when we were talking about dropping the ball problems, an upward velocity was positive and a negative derivative was that the ball was descending, but it is different when we're talking about springs. Now beta, that fabulous number beta, is found by the square root of k divided by m. So we have k as 4 and our mass, oh, it looks like we did need to calculate our mass, so I'm glad we did, is 1 16th. Okay, this is the square root of 64 when we flip the 1 16th and multiply, which gives us 8 for beta. Now let's take a look at the equation of motion and put this all together. So our equation of motion, ooh, motion was x of t is equal to c1 cosine of beta t plus c2 sine of beta t. And we have so far x of t is equal to c1 cosine beta has been calculated to be 8 plus c2 sine of 8t. 
Now, in order to find C1 and C2, we have to use those initial points that we calculated. So we have x at 0 is equal to 2 thirds. That was our initial displacement point. So we're going to have 2 thirds is equal to C1 cosine of 8 times 0 plus C2 sine of 8 times 0. We know that sine of 0 is 0, so this entire term is just 0, and cosine of 0 is 1, leaving us with C1 is equal to 2 thirds. Now let's find C2 by using the initial velocity point. So our initial velocity point was x prime of 0 is equal to negative 4 thirds. So we have negative 4 thirds. Oh, um, first things first, we should probably calculate the derivative. So because we're working with the derivative now, we need x prime of t. Well. Let's actually start over. Let's do x of t, which we know right now is c1 cosine of 8t plus c2 sine of 8t. We have found c1 to be 2 thirds, but we don't need to put that in yet. Let's find the derivative of this equation of motion. And the derivative of cosine is negative sine negative sine, keeping the inside function the same, and multiplying by the derivative of what's inside using our chain rule. So the derivative of 8t is 8. So I have negative 8c1 sine 8t. And then the derivative of sine is positive cosine. So same thing will be cosine of 8t and then multiply by the derivative of what's inside using the chain rule, so that gives us eight, and the C2 stays in front. Now we can calculate X prime at zero, so that's gonna be negative eight C1 sine times eight times zero plus eight C2 cosine of eight times zero, where this is equal to whoop, negative four thirds, we know that the sine function at zero is zero, which is fine because we already have C1. The cosine of zero is one. So this boils down to negative four thirds is equal to eight C2. Let's multiply by one eighth on each side. And we get that C2 is equal to negative one sixth. Now that we have C1 and C2, we can replace them into our equation for our final equation of motion. X of t is equal to 2 thirds cosine of 8t uh, ooh, minus minus one sixth sine of 8t. And that's the equation of motion for this problem. Let's take a look at what's next, heading back to the PowerPoint. So a differential equation of free damped motion, uh, so we just did free undamped motion. Free damped motion is where the C, the coefficient of the velocity term, is positive. The characteristic equation is mr squared plus cr plus k equals zero, which we practiced in our second order differential equations last week. The discriminant obtained from using the quadratic formula is c squared minus 4mk. Hopefully that rings a bell from the quadratic formula for c, um, which we usually have b squared minus 4ac, um, where this is a, this is b, and this is c. So essentially we're just rearranging the letters or 
substituting the letters rather. There are three cases for the discriminant. Now, if the discriminant is positive, remember in your algebra days with the quadratic equation, when the discriminant was positive, we expect to have two real answers. This is called overdamped. We'd have two roots that are real and distinct, so they're not repeated. They are completely separate, different answers. The equation of motion has the form of the following. X of t is equal to c1 times e to the r1t plus c2 times e to the r2t. The next case is when our discriminant is equal to zero. So recall from our quadratic formula learned back in algebra days that when our discriminant was equal to zero in the quadratic formula, that left us with just the beginning part of the formula, which was known as the vertex part, which means that the vertex was sitting on the x-axis and there is only one solution to expect. So the root is the same exact thing, negative b over 2a was the vertex formula, or at least the x component of the vertex, and we're just using our letters, so negative c over 2m. The equation of motion has the form of the following. So notice again that the r is the same, and so the second term has that extra variable in it. This is the same that we worked with when we were discussing how to solve second order differential equations. The third case is when our discriminant is less than zero. So recall when the discriminant is negative under a square root that produces imaginary roots or complex roots to be specific because there's that first part of the quadratic equation or formula. So under damped is when we have these discriminant less than zero and our roots are complex numbers. Alpha is the real part of the complex number and beta is the, uh, the imaginary part of the complex number. And this gives us the equation of motion in the following form, e to the alpha t times c1 cos beta t, c2 sine beta t. Let's try this example with overdamped motion in this differential equation. Again, I am going to head over to my whiteboard for some more room. So the equation that we're working with is x double prime plus 5x prime plus 4x is equal to 0. With initial conditions, x of 0 is equal to 1, and x prime of 0 is also equal to 1. So the coefficient of the second derivative, the acceleration, mass is equal to 1. The coefficient of velocity, c, is equal to 5, which is greater than 0. So because it's positive, we know we have real and distinct roots, which helps us recognize which equation of motion we need to use. And then the coefficient of the x term is 4, which is our proportionality constant. So our characteristic equation is r squared plus 5r plus 4 is equal to 0. We can solve for r1 and r2 in this case by easily factoring. So if we ask ourselves what two numbers multiply to 4 and add to 5, that's pretty straightforward, 4 and 1. Using our zero product property, we set each piece equal to 0 separately and solve for r, giving us r is equal to negative 4, we'll label that one as r1, and r2 is equal to negative 1. So we have x of t is equal to c1 e to the negative 4t plus c2 e to the negative t as our equation of motion. Again, in order to find c1 and c2, we need to use those initial conditions. So let me place up here what we know so far. And let's use the first initial condition, x of 0 is equal to 1. So we have 1 is equal to c1 e to the negative 4 times 0, 
plus C2 e to the negative 0. Now e to the 0 is 1. So both of these pieces are just 1. And that gives us the equation 1 is equal to C1 plus C2. So unlike the last problem, we have not found C1 or C2 by just using one initial condition. So we are going to have to rely on the next initial condition to try to get us somewhere. So let's look at the velocity initial condition. X prime of zero is also equal to one. Again, we need to actually find the derivative of the equation of motion. So X prime of T, if we take the derivative of this first term, remember taking the derivative of the E function is literally just copying it down as is. And then if anything in the exponent is more than just T, you multiply by the derivative of the function inside of the E function using the chain rule, and that would just be negative four. Same thing for the second term. Actually, that makes it negative. So we have negative C2e to the negative t because negative one is the derivative of negative t. Now let's apply the initial condition. One is equal to negative four C1e to the zero minus C2e to the zero, where we know that e to the zero is just one. So we get the equation one is equal to negative four C1 minus C2. So instead of actually having C1 and C2 solved by using the two initial conditions, we have a system of equations to solve. So we are going to be solving one is equal to C1 plus C2. One is also equal to negative four C1 minus C2. So recall those fabulous algebra skills that you have in solving systems of linear equations. And we can use graphing and assume that C1 and C2 are like X and Y, we can use substitution or elimination. If you've taken linear algebra already, I highly recommend just throwing this into an augmented matrix and doing reduced row echelon form, which will quickly solve this for you. This is not a bad one to solve out by hand using our way back in the day algebra skills. I'm just gonna use the process of elimination because the C1, C2s are already exactly the same coefficient, one and opposite signs. So when we add these, we are going to get zero there. And we get two is equal to one plus negative four, which gives us negative three C1. And we can solve for C1 of negative two thirds. Knowing C1, now we can just substitute that in to solve for C2. And I'm going to use this first equation to sub since there's less to work with there. There's less coefficients. So let me make some room over here. Finish this up. Hold on, erasing. Boop, there we go. So we have one is equal to, our C1 is negative two thirds plus C2. We add two thirds to the other side to get five thirds is equal to C2. Putting this all together, our equation of motion, x of t is equal to negative two thirds e to the negative four t plus five thirds e to the negative t. As our final answer. Let's head back to the PowerPoint for the next example. All right, we have two more examples. So this next one, a mass weighing eight pounds stretches a spring two feet. Assuming that a damping force numerically equals to two times the instantaneous velocity acts on the system. Determine the equation of motion if the mass is initially released from equilibrium position with an upward velocity of three feet per second. Alrighty, let's break this down. Again, you're gonna to wanna to keep this problem in front of you so you know what I'm referencing. Back to our whiteboard. So we know that weight is equal to mass times gravity 
which is also equal to proportionality constant times the stretch of the spring. Our weight given is eight pounds. So we have eight is equal to K times the stretch in feet, which is two. Now we're gonna keep that in feet because the velocity is in feet per second. So I already know that our units are fine. We divide by two and we again get four as our pounds per feet as our proportionality constant. That's not on purpose. It's not always gonna be four. It just happens to work out that way right now. Um, we still, we do need to solve for N because we will need it when we need to find, um, when we need to use it in the future. So we need to use it in our characteristic equation. So let's solve for M now. So we have eight is equal to M times 32, because again, we're working in feet. We divide by 32 and M is going to be one fourth slug. Okay, so we have M and we have K. Now the damping force, the damping force recall is defined by C. And we have written up here that this damping force is numerically equal to two times the instantaneous velocity. Okay, so C is equal to two. Now, two is greater than zero, which means that this is positive, and that's how we know we have a damping problem. Remember, if it was equal to zero, that would be undamped. So we have our M times X double prime plus C times X prime plus K times X is equal to zero. There is no external force, which is why it's said equal to zero. Our M was found to be a quarter. Our C is two. And our proportionality constant is four. So we have the characteristic equation, one fourth r squared plus two r plus four is equal to zero. Let's rewrite that. Now, when you're solving a, an a quadratic equation where there's a fraction bleh, in the front, it is probably in your best interest to multiply the entire equation by the reciprocal in order to get that one in front of r squared. Because if this thing happens to be factorable, that's always the fastest way to get your roots. So if we multiply through by four, we get r squared plus hr plus 16 equals zero. Let's try to factor this. What multiplies to give us 16 and adds to give us eight? You guessed it, that would be four. So we have a repeated, which means that if we were to calculate the discriminant, the discriminant would be equal to zero, indicating that we are expecting just one root, or essentially it's the same root repeated. Okay, I got negative four by setting the r plus four equal to zero and solving for four. Sorry, solving for r, duh. Okay, now r is equal to negative c over 2m. So we get negative 2 over 2 times 1 fourth, which also comes out to negative 4. So in this case, there were two ways to solve for that root. If you did the discriminant and the discriminant came out to be equal to zero, instead of doing all of this, um, instead of factoring, so let's say it wasn't easy to factor and you're like, you know what, let me check the discriminant and you know that it comes equal to zero, you could have done this. So this is an or. Notice that they give us the same answer. So we know that it's, it's, it's either way, um, but you wouldn't know to use this equation unless you had checked the discriminant. Okay, let's take a look at our initial conditions. So our initial position condition is at equilibrium. It didn't mention that the position of the mass was anywhere but equilibrium. 
And the initial velocity is negative three because it's stated in the problem that there was an upward velocity of three feet per second. And recall that uh, three feet per second in an upwards motion for springs is a negative velocity. So now let's take our equation of motion, x of t is equal to c1 e to the negative 4t plus c2 t e to the negative 4t. Remember there's that extra variable in there because the r is repeated and not distinct. There's not two different ones. So using our first initial condition, we have zero is equal to c1 e to the zero plus c2 zero times e to the zero. Now this zero in this term makes this whole term go to zero. This e to the zero is going to one, giving us our c1 directly as zero, meaning the entire first term of this is not needed. Now let's find C2. In order to do that, we need to take the derivative of the equation of motion. And again, that is going to be copying everything down times the derivative of what's inside for that first term. So we have negative 4C1e to the negative 4t. In the second one, we have a product rule. So we're going to have a bit more complication here where the first part of the product is c2 times t, and the second part of the product is e to the negative 4t. So recall the product rule has the derivative of one of the functions paired with the original second. So the derivative of c2t is c2, and we'll pair that with the original second equation, plus, and then you switch which one you're taking the derivative and which one's the original. So c2t stays the same, and then we multiply that by the derivative of e to the negative 4t, which is negative 4e to the negative 4t. Okay, let's use our initial condition now. So we have negative 3 is equal to negative 4c1e to the 0 plus, uh, let's see, c2e to the 0 plus c2 times zero, and then it doesn't even matter what's after this because it is all going to be zero on that second term there. So this whole thing is zero. This is one. This is one. So we're left with negative three equals negative four c1 plus c2. Now we know that c1 is zero, so that makes that term disappear, giving us C2 is equal to negative three. So overall, our equation of motion is X of T is equal to negative three times T e to the negative four T. Boom. Let's take a look at the last example. Okay, so our last example is looking at a problem about under damped motion. So a mass weighing 16 pounds is attached to a five foot long spring. At equilibrium, the spring measures 8.2 feet. If the mass is initially released from rest, not fro rest, from rest, <laughs> no idea, typo, uh, at a point of two feet above equilibrium position, find the displacements x of t if it is further known that the surrounding medium offers a resistance numerically equal to the instantaneous velocity. Woo, a lot going on here. Let's dive in. All right, first thing, let's discuss the stretch S. Now this time we don't need the equation uh, W equals KS or MG equals KS because it's actually defined in the problem. It's defined by when it says that the equilibrium of the spring measures 8.2 feet. And it also states that the mass is attached to a five foot long spring. So we know that five feet of the 8.2 is the spring's length. And we want to subtract that to find just the stretch.
So we get 3.2 feet as the stretch. The spring went from 5 to 8.2. Now let's find that K. So weight is equal to mass times gravity, which is equal to proportionality constant times spring stretch. If we look back in our problem, we were given the mass of weighing 16 pounds, which means we can skip this middle part and do 16 is equal to K times 3.2. Dividing by 3.2 on both sides, that gives us K is equal to five pounds per foot. Okay, so we have S, we now have K, we need M before we can build the differential equation. So we have weight is equal to mass times gravity. The weight was 16 pounds. We need to find the mass and we are using 32 feet per second squared because we're in feet. Divide our mass is equal to a half slug. Now that we have all of the pieces, oh wait, one more piece, our damping force known as C. If we look back in the problem, our damping force C is going to be equal to blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it's not mentioned like the last time. The last time it talked about the velocity being twice as much. Now it's just not talking about it. So therefore we would say that C is equal to one which is positive, okay? So it is a positive C giving us damping. And let's build our differential equation. So we know that M X double prime plus C X prime plus K X is equal to zero. There is no external force. Oh. That's where we got it from, um, sorry. So the wording of the problem says that the surrounding medium offers a resistance numerically equal to the instantaneous velocity, unlike the last problem where it said it was twice. So that's where we got the C equals one. Okay, now replacing what we just found, one half X double prime plus X prime because C equals one plus five X is equal to zero. Our characteristic equation then becomes one half r squared plus r is plus five is equal to zero. Again, I strongly recommend when there's fractions in front that you multiply by two all the way through, giving us r squared plus two r plus 10. Now, if I try to factor this, and try to think of two numbers that multiply to give me 10 and add to two, it's not gonna happen. There's nothing that does that. Which means that I could take a look at the discriminant to try to see if the discriminant is zero because then I know that finding R has a very simple formula. Or I can just jump to the quadratic formula and figure it out. So R is gonna be found by negative Let's see, I want to make sure you use the right letters. Negative C over 2M plus or minus the square root of M squared, just kidding, C squared minus 4MK all over 2M. So we get negative 2 over. Oh, for a second there, I was like C is equal to one, but I forgot we multiplied by two through the entire equation in order to eliminate that one half. Woo. Negative two over two times one plus or minus the square root two squared minus four times one times 10 all over two times one. So this gives us negative one plus or minus the square root of four minus 40 over two which gives us negative one plus or minus the square root of negative 36 divided by two. So we can see that we have complex roots. 
and we have a real part and we have an imaginary part. Now we do need to, we need to solve this imaginary part into terms of i. So luckily for us, the square root of negative 36 can be broken up between the square root of negative one and the square root of 36, which gives us i times six, six i. So that gives us negative one plus or minus six i divided by two. Overall, negative one plus or minus three i. So then we'll identify alpha as negative one, and we identified beta as three. So our equation of motion that we have so far is e to the negative t, c1 cosine of 3t plus c2 sine of 3t by placing in the alpha and the beta. Now, as always, to get C1 and C2, we have to use those initial conditions. So our initial position was stated that it is two feet above equilibrium. So that is X of zero is equal to negative two. And because it states in the original problem that this mass was released at rest, our initial velocity is zero. So we have, 2 is equal to e to the negative 0 times c1 cosine of 0 plus c2 sine of 0. We know sine of 0 is 0, so that whole term disappears. Cosine of 0 is 1. e to the 0 is also 1, leaving us with c1 is equal to 2. Okay. Now we need to find the derivative ugh, of this uh, equation of motion before we can use the initial velocity. Let me make some space and let's do the derivative. So if we're looking at this function, I can distribute that e to the negative t n and do two product rules, or I can just do one product rule. I'm gonna go with the one product rule. So my first equation is e to the negative t, and this is my long second equation for the product rule. All right, so we have the derivative of the first, which is negative e to the negative t times the original second. So that's c1 cosine 3t plus c2 sine 3t plus the original first times the derivative of the second. So that would be negative three C1 sine of three T plus three C2 cosine of three T. Okay, so now our initial velocity was zero, zero. So we have zero is equal to negative E to the zero power times C1 cosine of zero plus C2 sine of zero plus e to the zero times negative three c1 sine of zero plus three c2 cosine of zero. All right, we know that e to the zero is one and cosine of zero is also one. Sine of zero, zero, one, zero, one. Writing what's left, we have zero equals C1 plus three C2. We've already found C1. C1 was negative two, so we have zero is equal to negative two plus three C2. Add two to the other side, divide by three, and we have C2 is equal to 2 thirds. Now we are ready to put this whole thing together. So we have X of T is equal to E to the negative T, negative two cosine three T plus two thirds sine three T.
oops, here we go. And there's our final answer. All right, this was fun. See you guys next time.